Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is a podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and I am happy to be with you on another Tuesday, another author interview. I hope you had a wonderful weekend. Mine was very nice, very rainy on Sunday. Oh my goodness, my husband was out for a walk and got caught in a torrential downpour and ended up taking an Uber home because it was so very rainy. I was inside when it happened. Um, I was actually at church, so I couldn't go get him. I looked out the window and um, I mean, I could have gone and got him if I hadn't been at church with a friend, so didn't have a car. <laughs> um, anyway, so other than that, we had a very good weekend. We had a beautiful walk on Saturday. I think we walked five and a half miles, six miles, something like that, um, all along the boardwalk and exploring our new town and uh, just the beautiful scenery that um, Portugal has to offer. So it was a very nice weekend and the rain was definitely needed. So appreciated that. I mentioned at the end of the last episode that I am interviewing author Daphne Suman today uh, about her book, The Silence of Scheherazade. She is here to talk about that book. It is historical fiction. It is told through the viewpoints of four women from four different families and four different cultures. Let me go ahead and give you the description of that book. September 1905. At the heart of the Ottoman Empire in the ancient city of Smyrna, Scheherazade is born to an opium-dazed mother. At the very same moment, an Indian spy sails into the golden-hued, sycamore-scented city with a secret mission from the British Empire. When he leaves 17 years later, it will be to the smell of kerosene and smoke as the city and its people are engulfed in flames. Told through the intertwining fates of a Levantine, a Greek, a Turkish, and an Armenian family, this unforgettable novel reveals city and culture now lost to time. So this is um, a, a period of history, a, t a place in history that I didn't know a lot about. So it was really, really fascinating for me to read this story. And of course, you know, I love historical fiction and having this story told from the viewpoints of four different families, four very different families, but whose fates, as it says, are intertwined. And then four women from those families was just it was so fascinating to me, and I'm so glad that I got to learn more about this time period and also about um, this city of Smyrna, which burned to the ground and no longer exists as it did prior to this fire in 1922. So that was fascinating. And listening to Daphne talk about all the research that she did about this city that no longer exists as it did then um, during the time of the writing was was really fun. So um, we are going to get into that in the interview. And instead of me telling you what she's going to say about all of those wonderful things, let's go ahead and turn to the interview. Again, the book is The Silence of Scheherazade. The author is Daphne Suman. Let's get to that interview. Hi, Daphne. Welcome to the podcast. Hello. And first, actually, I need to apologize. Did I say your name correctly? Yes, you did. Okay. Perfectly. <laughs> I, I meant to ask you before we started. So thank you for that. Um, I am very happy to have you here. We're going to talk about your book. Um, it is called The Silence of Scheherazade. But before we get to the book, um, if you could start by telling uh, my listeners a little bit about yourself, that would be wonderful. Yeah, of course. Gladly, I would do that. Um, my name is Daphne or Daphne Suman. I'm from Istanbul, 
Turkey. I was born there and raised there and I lived there until age 28. And then I started traveling the world. And I guess I'm still traveling the world after almost 20 years. I'm in Athens in Greece, living with my cats and with my husband. Um, and I arrived here from the eastern side of the world. So I kind of traveled east from Turkey and then made a full tour and ended up um, Western neighbor of Turkey. And um, I'm a yoga teacher, Hatha yoga teacher. That's my day job, as they like to say in America. And at nights, I write books. I'm a novelist. I write um, fiction and also nonfiction. I write blogs and um, all sorts of things. And um, I, I write in Turkish, but most of my books are translated in many languages of the world. And English is one of them. And I'm, I'm very, very happy that the English um, reading community is, they're able to read my books. The Silence of Shehrazad is my first English book, and another one is coming up soon um, at the end of summer. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much for that. So you are in Athens, and um, I actually, I've mentioned this on the podcast briefly, but uh, my husband and I just moved to Portugal. So I am. Yes, I heard that. I listened to your podcast, <laughs> yeah. and I, I heard that. Bravo. So, and with, with two dogs, I heard you moved there. Yes, that was a challenge. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can imagine. We travel with our two cats and it is a challenge. I cannot imagine the dogs. Well, yeah. good for you and bravo. And I wish you all the best in the neighboring Mediterranean country over there. Oh, thank you. I was just going to say, I'm really happy that we, we connected at the right time because when we set this up, we, we set it up on Pacific time. And now <laughs> yeah. <I> <laughs> trying to make sure that we got we both were on the call at the same at the same time so we are actually yeah yeah um so let's talk about the book can you give an overview of the story of course the silence of shehrazad um i want to talk about the title a little bit this this title i picked um after a lot of thought shehrazad is a character well known in the middle east uh, she's not much known in the West, in Europe in, and in Americas. She's the narrator of um, the Arabian Nights, 1001 Night Stories, which is the um, fairy tales of the Middle East, let's say. And she's the narrator. And if um, the, the deal is that if she doesn't tell a story, she will be killed the next day. So she has to, like, it's a, you know, it's a me, there's a mean emperor and um, he is telling young women and Shehrazad finds a way out of this chain um, that she tells a story and she ends the story at the very um, important part so that the, the em emperor wants to hear it the next day. So just gives her another day. So she continues telling the story. So her um, life depends on her ability to narrate stories, um, meaning if she's silent, she will be dead. And here I use the name Shehrazad for one of my characters, not the Shehrazad of the Arabian Nights. Um, and this Shehrazad also narrates a story to us, but she is mute. She doesn't talk. She only writes. So, you know, for the ones who are reading the book, they will understand what it means. It's, it's about a silenced part of history, at least um, in my country, in Turkey. It's the end of Ottoman Empire um, and transition into the modern Turkish Republic. And what happened to the um, Christian populations of the Ottoman Empire, how they were um, kind of erased let's say, lightly erased from the geography and history of modern Turkish Republic, um, meaning the, the Greeks of Ottoman Empire, Armenians, um, some Catholic Levantines, we call them, the Europeans who actually lived in the Mediterranean coast for many centuries. So this book is about the silenced part of history. Um, and, and my Shehrazad narrates what is not spoken in many uh, parts of the world today, the end of Ottoman Empire and its Christian people. Yeah, there's a lot of different layers of what's going on in the book. Um, and so you, you really get an understanding of how many different cultures are coming together in this one space and how things are changing. So um, 
I would imagine that's why you chose to interweave like four different family stories together. Can you yes. talk a little bit about that? Yes, I picked a particular city, a particular town, an Ottoman harbor town called Smyrna. And Smyrna, uh, today it's in the modern Turkish Republic, we call the town Izmir, and it's the third biggest city of Turkey. Back then, it's one of the Levant towns, Levant meaning a harbor town by the Mediterranean Sea. And it, it was rich, it was cosmopolitan, it was um, dealing with a lot of trade with figs and grapes and a lot of tobacco was going from and lots of um, European, American, um, British uh, companies opened their um we opened their offices there. So a lot of different nations lived together in Smyrna, Turks, um, Greeks, Armenians, Jews, European, Catholic Europeans, Americans, British, um, Italians, and um, many other, you know, some of the um, Indians, They anybody who is dealing with trade, <clears throat> they were living there. And that created a beautiful cosmopolitan city um, and they lived like that for at least two, three centuries, like from 16th, 17th century onward until the 20th century. Smyrna was a fun, cosmopolitan, rich um, city where you actually f have different communities, dif different religions, different um, languages are sp spoken and they live, they managed to live side by side. 20th century with its um, the idea of nationalism, the ideology of national na nation states destroyed that harmony and that cosmopolitanism. And I wanted to um, talk about that destruction. And I picked four families to represent the Smyrna, not only to represent, just to portray the city I needed for different sections. And I picked four women because women are... Um, the networking pieces of the city, they were actually connecting. And I wanted to come up with a plot, which was a very difficult plot, by the way. I really worked hard to connect the dots myself. And um, my readers are doing the same. And I'm so happy that we are on the same page with them. Um, so those four women are connected to one another. And that's how the book, the story is, um, is made out of their connection, their network. All right, so now that you know a little bit more about the book and the plot and the setting, we're going to go ahead and take uh, the first break of the podcast. When we come back, Daphne will be talking more about these four women and the four families from whose points of view the story is told. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Do you want to be healthier, yet you just don't know what to do? All these shows telling you this and that, but nothing seems to work. Well, listen close. Golden State Media Concepts has got something great for you. The health and wellness podcast dedicated to workout trends, healthy eating habits, diet, and everything about healthy living. Join us in our banters as we help you not just live life to the fullest, but live it to the healthiest. as you know, to author Daphne Suman about her book, her historical fiction book, The Silence of Scheherazade. Let's go ahead and return to the interview. And what about these um, four women do you think might resonate with readers? Because, the, you know, each, each, each woman is so different. And so I, I feel like um, different readers will be able to connect with at least one, if not multiple of the women. Okay. So who are those four women? Um, Edith Lamarck is a French... Um, a citizen of Smyrna, citizen of Ottoman Empire. We call them Levantines. They're French origin, but actually never or very rarely go to France. They are raised in um, Ottoman Empire. Edith is one of them, a young woman, uh, a Bohemian, because we are in the 1920s. 
Um, so the world is changing. Um, there are lots of art, lots of smoking, lots of parties. Um, there's a little bit of a great Gatsby atmosphere in the rich families of Smyrna. And Edith is from a rich French family. There is Panayota. Uh, she's from a much more um, a poorer neighborhood, a Greek neighborhood. Her father is a, a is the grocer of the neighborhood. Um, she lives not so far from Edith, but a completely different social strata. And she's a teenager. She's very pretty. And she's the, the prettiest girl in the neighborhood. There is um, Sumbul who is a, a Turkish woman. She lives far from the Christian uh, communities of Smyrna. She's married to um, a high officer who is fighting first in the Ottoman army and later when the Turkish resistance movement begins against the Ottomans, against the emperor, uh, her husband fights in the Turkish resistance na national movement. So she's alone. Her husband is always at war somewhere in the inner land. And there is a midwife. Midwife Meline is the one actually who connects all these three women together um, by giving birth to their, well, not giving birth, but by letting um, a birth take place that connect them together. There's also a fifth, there are many other women and men, of course, but there's a fifth character, which I actually find it very interesting. And I truly enjoyed writing her chapters. She's the gypsy Jasmine or Yasemin or Yasemi, because her name changes as she changes, as she moves from one neighborhood to the other. She's the one who carries the news from um, one group of women to the other. So like all these women in different districts of rich, beautiful Smyrna are connected um, through something that they don't know, but also through the network of gossip through Gypsy Jasmine. Yeah, I love how um, the women are so different and represent so many different aspects of the culture um, within that melting pot of the times, because you do get such a, a beautiful picture. It's, it's, a, it's a bit of a mosaic of the different characters and how they fit together. Um, their stories start weaving together. Um, what kinds of research did you do for the book? Um, well, it's a historical fiction. It's taking, it's starting in 1905 and then going all the way to 1922, a little bit, it's going actually all the way to 1926 as Shehrazad narrates events. Um, it's going further in time, all the way to today it comes, but I, it, the research part I needed mostly between 1905 to 1922, which is the end of um, Turkish-Greek war and, and Turkish army wins the war and gets uh, Smyrna and kicks all the Christian populations out of Smyrna and makes it, um, you know, only Turkish uh, city. So um, I had to do so much research. It was crazy, but it was fun, but also crazy. I couldn't write a chapter without doing it. Like I was writing one sentence but then I needed to do some research because I didn't know if they had, let's say, electricity in the house. So which houses had electricity? So I was doing some research in order to get the atmosphere. And then the whole city at the end of the book, we know that. And from the very beginning, we know that actually Smyrna burns, burns to ashes. It disappears at the end of the Greek-Turkish War in 1922 in um, September 1922, the, the city disappears completely. So if you go to Izmir today, you don't find anything from the old Smyrna. So I needed to do a lot of um, map research from the old maps of the insurance companies of the early 20th century, just to find what street, what house, what building, what kind of an hotel was where. I read lots of novels that were about Smyrna. Uh, a lot of research books. I was mostly reading books, um, trying to find uh, any photos. I think I was able to see all the photos, all the postcards, all the movies that, that were related to Smyrna. It took me two years to complete writing this book 
um, mostly because of the research. Like I had the plot, I had the story in my mind, but certain big pieces were missing. Like where is her house? How far is it from, you know, this patisserie? How far is it from her house? So how long does it take for her to walk from there to, and are there cars? Are there horse carriages? Are there trains? Where's the train schedule? So I was getting a little bit, uh, I think crazy about the realistic details. I wanted to create the world um, back then, just like the way it was, so that when it's destroyed by the big fire, by the great fire of Smyrna, um, I wanted all readers to understand the immensity of loss. And for that, in order to create that feeling, I needed to give as much as details possible to for us to live there. I wanted us to live there. I, first of all, I wanted to live there myself. So for that, I needed to have every single detail, every color, every weather. And the funny thing, I actually never been to Iz Izmir when I wrote this. That was the other thing. Like, I didn't know the town. I was writing, I was in Portland, Oregon at that point, And I was writing the whole thing from Portland, just looking at photos and Google Maps and old maps and everything. But two years of uh, hardcore research needed, yes. I'm glad you told me how long you, you took to write the book, because as you were talking, I was going to ask how long did you spend researching? Because it sounds like you did such a deep dive, which is... I did. Perfect. It was the moment I started writing, I think it was like some November of something. And then by the time the book was published, it was two and a half years later. And I spent those two and a half years really deeply immersed. And one, I felt like one side of me was living in Smyrna. Like one of me was living in my life in Portland and the other part was completely in Smyrna and thinking, um, getting dressed like them. I was getting dressed like the 1920s. I had my hair cut like that. I started buying shoes from that time. So it was, I did everything needed <laughs> and to be part of this story. Well, and, and Portland is beautiful, but Portland is nothing like <laughs> I would have. <laughs> not, I, I, I've never been to. Um, I've never been there either. I've never been to Greece, but but I can imagine that Portland and ain't Smyrna, as it existed, are nothing alike. <laughs> no, nothing. But it, it's it's good because it made me miss my country more and more. Like the more I was away, the more my desire to write and find things about it was. It was very funny. It was a longing to a time that I never lived. It was longing to a piece of geography. It's a town I have never lived. But the longing was so strong. And towards the end of the book, as I was writing the final chapters, and it's the chapters about the great fire as the city is burned into ashes, um, every character in my head, they were racing to tell their part of the story first. So I was really typing. I was in a coffee shop in Portland um, and trying to type. And at the same time, I was hearing Panayota saying, I'm going to tell you my story. And then Edith was saying, no, let me tell you what happened to me that night. And, and Sumbul was saying, no, I want to tell you what was going on for us on that night. So it was a like a weird experience and I was like typing and typing and typing so the end came very quickly time for our second break of the podcast when we come back we'll be talking more about character development so stay tuned you're listening to the GSMC book review podcast and I will be right back Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch, whatever it may be. Visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome 
Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my interview with Daphne Suman. We are talking about her book, The Silence of Scheherazade, Historical Fiction. Let's get back to the interview. How about your characters? What, before you started writing, did you have um, a really good picture in your head of each character or did they develop more as you wrote? Not at all. I had no idea. I knew I wanted to write um, The Destruction of Smyrna. That I had in mind. I had no idea who the characters were going to be. Uh, the first one who appeared was Edith. And um, she's the one who actually resembles me the most. Um, so I started from Edith and it, it, it was a long story like it, there was a lot of beginning about her. Of course, the first draft is completely different from what you have in your hand at the end. This is maybe the third or fourth draft. Um, the first draft was a something else. Edith was a something, you know, some other character. And then she developed into who she is um, today. Then slowly, slowly, the others, okay, Edith must have a lover. Where will this lover be? Okay, let's see somebody outsider. I need an outsider. Let's make it Indian because I'm familiar with India because I'm a yoga teacher. I know the Indian culture. Um, so I can easily create a character from India, I thought. So I created Avinash. And then slowly, slowly, the others arrived. It's um, sometimes I like creating characters. I sometimes resemble it playing with my dolls as a child. Like I, I played until I was almost 13 years old. I played with my Barbies. Like mm -hmm. I was a case and my parents were worried that I was still playing with dolls. And when everybody was becoming a teenager and dealing with teenager stuff, I was still playing. Um, but it's kind of, Creating a character is like playing with your Barbies. Like with the Barbies speak to you. They have their own character. You don't think about it. think about their characters. When you have a doll, you look and as a child, that doll speaks to you. I have this. And the other one says, I have these characteristics. I don't like this. I don't put, don't put me there. Characters come to me like that. Um, I start writing Edith Lamarck and Edith Lamarck starts to talk to me. Mm -hmm. Then Panayota talks to me in a different way. So that's a, the character building is an effortless thing for me. And when somebody interferes and says, oh, this character is not very realistic. I don't think a woman at her age would do something. I get really upset. Like, no, this is how it is. She already spoke to me. Like, I can't change it. This is how she is. If she's not realistic, I'm sorry. That's how she is. <laughs> she's. She's spoken and that's all there is to it. Yeah, yeah. I can't do anything. I feel like they exist somewhere. And actually, Salman Rushdie has a very nice book uh, recently, like last year or two years ago, I bought it. Um, Kishot, it's called, or Quixote, like Don Quixote, but Don, the Don part is not there, Quixote. And there he does talk about a world of fiction characters. They have their own world. And at the end of his book, like they slowly seep into the um, room of the writer, but they're tiny, like they're like the size of your hand, but they are there mm -hmm. with their with their own will and yeah. um, characters. Fascinating. I love it. Um, what is it about writing um, historical fiction? Do you think it draws you to that particular genre? Well, I love history. I always loved history. History was my favorite subject at school, believe it or not. Um, I I don't know. I think like we go back to that longing that I mentioned. Um, there are certain times in past I wish I lived there. Um, and this was one of them. Like I really wanted to live in old Smyrna before it was burned, of course. Um, and it, it all started with another book. It all started with Middlesex. Middlesex is a novel by Jeffrey Eugenides. And um, it's, a, it's a famous um, American novel. And um, it starts in Smyrna. But then it moves to Detroit and it kind of continues. But it carries Smyrna to its chapters because the grandparents are from Smyrna. And... 
Uh, when I read Middlesex, I was like, oh, shoot, I wish they, you know, I wish he wrote more chapters on Smyrna because I really wanted to read more how life was there. And just like sounds fascinating, all these cosmopolitanism, different languages, roses, beautiful women, cafes and and all that. And it's very sad destruction. I wish I, you know, there was more chapters. Then I said to myself, well, if you want to have more Smyrna, you should write it. You write an entire book. So that's how it started. They always say, if you know, you're not seeing, the, if there's a book that you want to read that doesn't exist, then you're supposed exactly, to write it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's what I did. And, and, and it was, it's supposed to be historical fiction going back to circling back to your question, because it was, I longed to be in that time. So I wrote that. I don't write. This is my only historical fiction, actually. I, the, all the other books I write, I like flashbacks a lot. Uh, big chunks of the books, of my books, they actually go back in time. But this is the only one that's taking place from the beginning to the end in the past, in history. Mm -hmm. That's a really nice segue, actually. Thank you. Because uh, before we started recording, you said that you had just finished... Um, uh, your most recent book, and you also have one that's um, either has come out or is coming out in 2022. Can coming you talk out, little, yes. Talk a little bit about both of those stories. Okay. Well, yes, I'm very excited. Today is the day I finished my um, new novel. I've been working on it for a year, at least. I mean, it's it was it started turning in my head long before, but first chapter on computer I wrote exactly one year ago. Uh, in March, and today I wrote the end at the end of the 40th chapter. So this was like 15 minutes before our interview started. And um, it's a very happy, happy moment when a book really ends because you never know if it's going to end. There's always this danger of them leaving you in the middle of the road. That can happen. This time it didn't happen. And I'm grateful to all the fairies and everything, whoever is helping me, <laughs> that it has come to the end. Um, this one is again taking place today. Actually, it's taking place in the first lockdowns of COVID. Um, it's taking place in 2020, March and April. Um, in Istanbul, in Turkey, and there are many flashbacks, actually. Most of the book is an old narrator. Again, I like old narrators, I guess. This is a male old narrator um, telling his life from 1950s onwards to today, um, and this time it's kind of a um, space, memory, um, loss, again, um, that we experience in the world in general and specifically in Istanbul. This time I'm back home because I am from Istanbul. So I wanted to have a little um, memory space connection about Istanbul. And this, this book right now it's in Turkish, but hopefully it will be translated to English soon and will be available for the um, English speaking people of the world. Um, the other one at the breakfast table, at the breakfast table is um, is a book I wrote in 2019 or 18. Sorry, I wrote in 2018 in Turkish and translated to English um, lately, and will be published by Head of Zeus in the UK in September. Thank you. That's so exciting. One final break of the podcast, and when we come back, we'll be talking about translation and the uh, conclusion of my interview with Daphne. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Golden State Media Concepts Social Media Podcast. Time to hashtag everything. We talk about all the fun, crazy stories on social media. From Instagram to Facebook, Twitter to Tumblr, or probably even Friendster. Join us each week as we explore the quirky side of social media. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Social Media Podcast. It's simple, it's simple, such a sad song. The one that... Welcome back to the 
GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with author Daphne Suman. And it's it's wonderful that your books are being translated into different languages. So people it's can really them. wonderful. Really, yeah. when you're you know when you write in Turkish, I mean, okay, it's lovely to have readers in your native language. It's it's perfect. But then, you know, Turkey is not a small country, but still, it's just one country in the world. And I'm a traveler, you know, I travel the world. I meet tons of people who always ask me, when can we read your novels? And I'm always like, mm, I used to be. I don't know, you know, they're all in Turkish. And then one day I said, what am I doing? I have to, you know, I have to hire a translator and translate all these um, books into English. And that's the only way I can open up to the world. So I found an amazing woman, an English teacher, an American woman um, at the age of 80, and she, she still lives in Turkey. She moved to Turkey in 1960s and, and worked as an English teacher at an English high school, uh, American high school, and she accepted translating my books. We started working together and she turned out to be an amazing translator with a true love for literature and understanding you know nothing today some of the professional translators they have they're so busy their translation could be like a little bit me mechanical fast but my translator her name is betsy M betsy has time she has love um so she translates with gusto and i'm mm -hmm. very very happy that i'm working with her and the moment i had the books in english the the publication houses were interested that's the that's one thing i can say to the you know the writers of the non-english countries you have to um open the wallet and at the beginning make that investment you know hire the translator pay out of pocket and then the roads open that way well, it sounds like it was it was meant to be in terms of you know finding betsy and it sounds like she's perfect so it, she is perfect yeah how about writing itself um it, it's um not as you said your day job but it, it's definitely your passion I can hear it in your voice uh, is it something you always wanted to do was to write for publication or did that come <laughs> later in life it was the last thing I wanted to do it was you know as a child I was writing like crazy passionately all the time like couldn't stop writing and everybody coming to my room, seeing me writing, and they said, oh, you're going to be a writer. And I was like, no, no, I'm going to be an actress. I'm going to be in Hollywood, and I'm going to be, like, acting in movies. That was my dream. Um, like, writing was so not what I wanted, but I couldn't stop it. Like, it's, it was definitely um, my gift in this life. I was supposed to do that. So I resisted for a long time, didn't show my writings to anyone, you know, I hid everything. Um, then I started yoga at the age of 28. And when I started yoga, I, I started facing what I truly want in this life, not like what I should do, or what I fooled myself about my real desires I really come face to face with what was given to me and I should utilize that and it was writing because I was still writing like crazy only not showing it to anybody so I started writing for publication and in a few years like in 10 years after that decision I had my first books published wonderful thank you yeah uh, thank you out of that experience, then, do you have advice for um, aspiring authors, especially authors, as you just mentioned, who maybe don't write in English? Yeah. Well, the ones who don't write in English, first of all, whatever language comes to you, you should write in that language. I know, you know, some people, uh, especially younger people now, they're much more in relationship with English. So they read more in English. They watch movies in English. Like I didn't grow up speaking English. I didn't speak English until the age of, I don't know, 25 or something. Um, at school, I learned a little bit, but not much. Um, but whatever comes, you should write in that language. And translation is always available. There are wonderful translators uh, in the world. Um, if 
somebody once told me about acting because like i said i really wanted to be um an actress and somebody told me if it's in you it will never leave you so the, this i have to say for writing if it's in you it will never leave you so one day if you can surrender and let it grow because there's a lot of work. It's not just talent. It's not just gift. There's a lot of work needs to be done, um, but you have to make peace with it. If it's in you, it's in you. If it's not in you, I don't think by pushing you can become a writer. Even though it might, it may, it may be like my dream of becoming an actress. It wasn't really in me, even though it was my dream. But the gift is usually somewhere hidden in your childhood. Whatever you are. Um, doing as a child, it really comes to you when you grow up, although you just need to look in and recognize it. Um, that's what I would say, not to force it if it's not in you. If it's in you, let it grow. Mm -hmm. um, but one, the, the work, the hard work is about not creating something superficial. I think that's the hardest work. Not, not writing something cliche, not repeating what's already out there. Of course, the stories are limited. We always tell the same story. It doesn't matter. We, we will tell the same story, but we can tell the same story in our version. And that finding your own version, not what's um, fashionable, not what is supposed to be, not what other people will think, none of those things. What's real original version of your story of the same story in you um like finding what is genuine about you why did you come into this world what is your um existence in in this world speaking to the other people finding out this one is very hard that's the hardest work because you kind of go to those cliches you read things and oh i can write similar something like that um Readers know. Readers understand. Readers, they recognize something genuine, something original, than something repeated again, um, or secondhand, let's say, secondhand story, they realize. I don't know if it makes sense. The right. story is always the same, love story, loss, uh, mourning, whatever. But how do you narrate that is very, very unique to each and every individual, to each and every writer. Yeah, and I think, I think you're right. I think readers will recognize that voice if it's, if it's genuine. Um, so Defin in definitely. In terms of reading, um, do you have favorite authors or favorite genres that you like to read? Yes. Um, I like, maybe because I'm from Turkey, I like... Um, Eastern, Asian, but not Far East Asian, Indian, Afghani, Pakistani writers, the um, countries where they actually come in um, contact with the West, like India, for example, I think has amazing literature. Salman Rushdie, I already mentioned, Arundhati Roy is one, my favorite author, The um, God of Small Things is my favorite book ever. Um, and then um, Kite Runner from Afghanistan coming. I like the literature of um, kind of, how do you call it, subcontinent Asia, let's say. Um, and then Tom Robbins, Forever, my, my guy. I like all books of Tom Robbins. Um, I read, of course, a lot of Turkish literature or Hampamuk is uh, one author that I um read whatever he writes. Elif Shafak is another Turkish um, author that I like her books very much. Um, yeah, and I try to read like from Europe, Northern Europe, from Italy, from France, like usually whatever comes, um, I pay attention lately, whatever is being published in the literary genre, and I try to read as much as possible um, a diverse international um, selection. Okay, so now I just have to ask, how many languages do you speak and how many languages can you read in? <laughs> oh, I can read only in Turkish and in English. 
only okay. these two, unfortunately. I speak Greek because I live in Greece. Um, mm -hmm. I'm learning it. I learned quite a bit, but it's a difficult language. I'm still learning it. That's it. Okay. Like I used to, I used to speak French. I forgot completely when I learned <laughs> Greek. It's gone. It, unbelievable how it's erased. And I lived uh -huh. in Thailand for three years, and I was able to have a communicate a conversation with a taxi driver in the traffic of Bangkok, which is like forty minutes of a conversation. I was able to do nothing. I remember now, except the Thai food. <laughs> Only the Thai food names I still remember. When I look at the menu of a Thai restaurant, I can say this is um, shrimp, this is chicken, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> the brain is amazing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know you have a website, so if you can share your website as well as where people can find you on social media. Okay. I'm everywhere. No, there is nothing hard in finding me. Um, my website is, I actually had it built last year and it's beautiful. It's www.defnesuman.com and my name is written D-E-F-N-E. -E. So it's like Daphne in the Turkish version, defnesuman.com. And social media, same. If you type my name, Defne Suman, I appear Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I'm not as young for TikTok, so I don't have TikTok. Um, but I have the old, old school social media. Okay, I, old school. That makes me laugh since the, you know they haven't been around that long. <laughs> I, I understand what you're what you're saying. I don't have new. I don't understand those Snapchats and TikToks and like I say. Okay, that's it. I mean, let's stop there. <laughs> I understand. Um, we you need to have a child for those. Like without a child, it's really hard to catch up with the new they, they are new old wave old. of social media. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, we've talked about a lot of different things uh, during our time together, but is there anything that we haven't touched on that you were hoping to be able to talk, uh, talk about during this time? Um, no, I think we covered everything. Um, All right. No. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay. Well, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your evening, um, especially out well, of your celebration you. time to talk to me. Well, we're <laughs> going to celebrate now, like the Good. whole house is waiting for me. <laughs> Good. Enjoy your celebration. And thank you so much. Everybody. Well, thank you it. so much. And much love. Thank you once again to Daphne for joining me to talk about the silence of Shahrazad. Okay, I know at one point during the interview, I said Greece when I meant Turkey. I really did mean Turkey. Once I said it, I was like, oh, shoot, I said the wrong country. And then I didn't want to interrupt just to say, hey, I said the wrong country. So now I'm saying it right now. So in case you noticed it and you're yelling at me through, <laughs> through whatever app you were listening, you're listening to the podcast on, I, I do realize that I said if Greece, I meant Turkey. Either way, well, yeah, yeah, I don't know what I'm talking about anymore. <laughs> but thank you so much to Daphne. This was such a beautifully um, rich, richly written book. And it's so evocative just with the depth of the detail that she puts in in order to make ancient, well, not ancient, um, to make Smyrna of a uh, hundred years ago, basically. Yeah, 1922. A hundred years ago, come alive in a way that we can't experience it anymore. And the fates of these four families, especially the four women, just um, are, are so well woven together. So you get this really detailed, lush, intricate, layered picture of this time period which is a really great way I think to write historical fiction so thank you to Daphne thank you as always to you my listeners I hope that you will do a few things first I hope you'll join me for the next episode I'll be speaking to author Eva Shaw about her book The Seer it's again historical fiction and somewhat similar time frame we've jumped ahead about 20 years to around the time of World War II, but um, this time we're in New Orleans, so it is a historical mystery, so I hope that you will join me for that interview. In the meantime, if you could uh, like, subscribe, do all that wonderful stuff to this podcast so you can get new episodes and listen to those. Also follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. That would be awesome. And as always, if you haven't done so already, please do 
rate the podcast, uh, give it a, um, a star ranking or rating, excuse me, or a written review, whichever one is. Uh, float in your boat today, whatever way you feel best about doing that, I would greatly appreciate it because it does help to get the podcast out to more people who love books. So thank you in advance for anything you might do of those few things that I just listed. Hope you're having a great week. I hope that week continues to be wonderful. And of course, I hope that that week involves plenty of time for you to get yourself lost in a good book or multiple good books, whatever. Um, but take time to read and get lost in a good story. Thank you so much. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in G GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.